Your hands were made for greatness. Mighty hands for painting, paneling, and clicking the submit order button on homedepot.com to get that duvet. And these Egyptian cotton towels delivered right to your door. Do more with decor at the Home Depot. Save up to 30% on select bedding and bath. Now at homedepot.com. More saving, more kinds of doing. Ballot on select items online only. Free delivery on select items $45 or more. Enter promo code BEDBATH15 at purchase for an extra 15% off. Visit homedepot.com for more information. Welcome, everyone, to Creating a Family. Talk about infertility and adoption. Today's show is an interview with five different women who chose five different paths to resolving their infertility. Great show. I think you will really like it. Here's a sample of what you're going to hear. One of the hardest things for me about going over to surrogacy is you you have to give up control, and that was (laughs) really hard for me, super, super hard. But you just have to accept the gift that she's willing to give to you. This show is brought to you by Creating a Family. We are the National Infertility and Adoption Education and Support Nonprofit. And we are launching this week a brand new e-guide on, wait for it, adoption announcements. This is one we have had so much fun making. We collected the best of the best of adoption announcements for all types of adoption, infant adoption, foster care adoption, international adoption, uh, and we've got bits chock full of pictures, more pictures than text, as you would imagine. Uh, Lots of ideas on how to announce your adoption, some cautions about the when and the how and all that and words to use. Uh, All of that is available. And even more important, as a gift to you, it is free for a very short period of time. (laughs) So jump onto our website and grab your copy now. Uh, To get to it, you would go to our website, creatingafamily.org. Hover over Resources, click on e-guide, and you can pop it. uh, it, uh, I don't know what it says at this point uh, as far as cost, but when you uh, check out, it will uh, will show as as no charge uh, for the next couple of weeks uh, as, hey, it's our Christmas gift or our holiday gift, I should say to you. This show, the Creating a Family radio show, is underwritten by our corporate sponsor, Faring Pharmaceutical. Faring has a free program they want you to know about. It's called My Fertility Navigator. This program offers free one-on-one support for women who are struggling to get pregnant and are unsure of what to do. You enroll in the program, My Fertility Navigator, and then you will receive a personalized navigator. It's guidance from a live actual human being, a person who can provide important information about, of course, fertility and infertility, as well as providing you a list of nearby fertility centers and information about how to finance fertility treatment or how to afford fertility treatment, and talks. And, and they will also be able to give you information about the various treatment options that are available. To find out more, go to their website, myfertilitynav.com slash C-A-F. So this show is based on a book, uh, a book I really enjoyed. The name of the book is Detours, Unexpected Journeys of Hope Conceived from Infertility. It, in this book, it is a, uh, it's individual essays by a number of women. Actually, I didn't even count the full number, and we have five of them here today. And each of the women will discuss their their infertility journey, and then we're going to just open it up to, I was going to say a free-for-all, but that uh, considering there's six of us on air, that probably isn't a good idea. We won't really be a free-for-all, but we will open it up to a general discussion of some of the universals uh, of infertility as some of the, and as well as some of the differences and in, in different ways it affected each of them. A good book, again, the name is Detours, Unexpected Journeys of Hope Conceived from Infertility. We're going to start with Sue Johnston. Sue, uh, actually, you were the first one who contacted me about the book, and I am. Uh, we, it, it's funny. I, we get so many requests for interviews, and and often book authors. And honestly, it's it's hard because we would like to be able to uh, to, to do a show with 
everybody. I, I published a book a, a long time ago, and I so remember the excitement. And, and, and I want to be able to, and, and the nervousness and all that when a book comes out, and I so would like to be able to help every new author. But the truth is we, we really can't, and we almost seldom do. But your book really intrigued me. Um, so we went ahead, and, and it took a while to get this organized because it's hard to do a show with uh, a panel of five. So I thank you for your, your inspiration. Um, but let's start and talk about uh, your, your journey, your infertility journey, and, uh, and how you ended up resolving it. Um, how, you know, how did it begin? Uh, how many treatments did you go through, or did you go through any treatments? I know because I actually read your essay, but tell us. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dawn, for having me on and uh, the other members of the uh, authors of the of the book. And I just wanted to say, um, well, my journey is was rather long, but uh, ten years to be exact. Um, when I was a little girl, I used to always want to grow up and be a mom. And um, my, I used to ask my mother for another baby brother or sister, and she would say, "You need to, you know." Um, realize that you're going to be the youngest of the family, maybe we can get you a dog, but you are going to be our baby. So at that point in time, I said, I think I want to be a teacher so I can have as many children as I'd like. And so I went into elementary education and got married and, uh, and I, when it came time for us to, uh, to try to have a baby, which we probably, um, tried about six months with just, you know, going to my OBGYN. And at that point, we did all of the uh, testing, um, you know, the whole gambit of testing, post-coital, hamster egg penetration, all that kind of, all these crazy things that we did. And everything came and back I will picture say, perfect. Just let me interrupt a second. I will also yeah. say the test that I was in, one of the interesting things reading this book was how uh-huh. many things are no longer done, like you were talking those are no longer right. done. Zip, right, gift, right, right. That was, that was kind of an interesting thing as well. Sorry to interrupt. Go back right ahead. Though. Yeah, no, 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 no. I'm glad you did because, um, you know, it's funny. We'll, we'll address some of that later maybe when we have the open discussion. But, uh, yeah, so after doing and passing all these tests with flying colors, then I um, was decided it was time to go see a reproductive endocrinologist. And I went to see um, – a gentleman, and we tried uh, probably about five or six rounds of IUI uh, with pergonol, metrodone, you know, ovulating, stimulating medications. And um, I'm married to a former naval officer, and right in the middle of all of this, we got orders to the Philippines. And so we were just about ready to start trying um, an in vitro, but we, the Navy threw us a, a loop, and we were gone for about two and a half years. So that was a very difficult time. That was probably the lowest time in my fertility journey because I was in a third world country, and I knew that I would have very little um, help when I was over there. Although I did try some treatments, you'll have to read about them in the book. Uh, because it's pretty crazy. The name of the hospital was called Jungle General, and uh, that's intriguing enough just right there for you guys to pick up the book uh, and read about that. But two and a half years later, I came back to the United States, and that's when I decided that I was going to go full bore into IVF. And um, and that's when I joined Resolve, the National Infertility Support Association in San Diego. And that's when I met the other ladies on this on this uh, panel today. The women in Resolve became my lifeline. I did three in vitros that were unsuccessful. Um, and at that time, we were doing six embryos, the first one, the eight embryos, the second time six embryos the third time. This was before pre-genetic testing on embryos and whatnot. Um, The fourth time was the time I actually got pregnant with my son, and um, we did three embryos via a laparoscopy, which is ZIFT, zygote intrafallopian transfer, and two embryos into my uterus, which was was IVF. And I don't know if my son is a ZIFT or an IVF baby, but... um, That was the cycle that worked. And after that, nine months later, we had our one and only son. We did try with frozen embryos and whatnot um, another round of ZIFT IVF, 
but it was unsuccessful. And that at that point, I decided that we were done. We were done physically, emotionally, and it was a whole. You know, it was like ten years from start to finish. So that's basically my journey, okay. um, in a nutshell. And, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Perfect. Okay. And next up, uh, let me also mention, I should have mentioned this at the beginning, a couple of our guests have chosen to use pseudonyms, pseudonyms uh, so uh, just note that as well. Um, the next up I want is Lee Allison. And, Lee, I thought this was so – I wanted to read from your essay. It was something that re- – a paragraph that really touched me. I should mention that this – that the, the paragraph I'm going to read uh, – was on a scrap of paper that you found many years after the fact uh, that you had written down in the midst of treatment. Um, And I'm quoting now. Our perfect family dog is graying around the snoot and walks a little stiffly in the morning. We are on our second four-door practical car. My best friends from my single days have children who ride bikes without training wheels and are learning their multiplication tables. I have been struggling unsuccessfully with infertility for a long time. I have been seeing evidence of my failure monthly for eight long years. I have never worked so hard for so long for so little. Beautifully written, Lee, um, and uh, it brought tears to my eyes, and, and, and it's certainly something that many, many, sadly many, many, in our audience have experienced. So uh, how many failed IVFs, and, and I'd, let's not make a distinction between some of the uh, procedures that uh, that you've done in the past, Zift and Gift are no longer done, so let's just say IVFs and call them all that. H- uh, Lee, how many uh, failed IVFs uh, did you go through, and how long in total uh, uh, were you in treatment? Well, I, we started trying to get pregnant right when I turned 30, and my um, first child was born um, right before I turned 39. So we were at it for quite a while. And I think initially I was just so trustful of the doctor. So when we went, when I went in and said, you know, this isn't happening, um, I just kind of threw it all out to them. And they, we did the testing, and then we tried Clomid and various. I just clung to those treatments for a really long time because I thought they would work. Um, mm-hmm. And it really wasn't until... I started going to resolve after a few years of unsuccessfully trying to get pregnant that I realized I needed to be a little bit more proactive about what was happening and um, a little bit more assertive with the doctors about moving on and trying something different. Um, I don't, our, we were with an HMO and they didn't do IVF, so I stuck with them as long as I could and we did a, a number of uh, Pergonal IUIs, and finally they just said, you know, we can't do anything else for you. It's time for you to move on. Um, I don't remember exactly how many IVFs we did, at least, because we would do one, and then we'd do, we usually had enough embryos left over to do a frozen cycle. We probably did at right. least four from scratch, um, and then I got to the point where I just was done, and my husband and I couldn't come to agreement about adoption, and... Um, The doctor we were going to at the time mentioned donor egg. And even though we really didn't have a diagnosis that was a showstopper for us, they could not find any reason why we shouldn't be able to get pregnant. I was just so ready to be a parent that I thought, you know, let's just go for it. I didn't really have – it didn't bother me that I wouldn't be genetically related to the child. I just wanted to be a mom. So he just pulled out this three-ring binder that had – that would had pages of donors in and kind of flip through and like, what do you think about this one? And flip the page through and what do you think about this one? It was just, it was a very strange experience trying to look at these <laughs> women and think this is the potential genetic mom of my child. Um, so we, we picked somebody that had been at his clinic and they had had success with, and she was similar physically to me. I'm tall and fair and, and so is she and, um, and went for it. So we didn't ever meet her, but we had a profile of her. Um, She was in her early 20s, had three children, um, was going to college, um, and was just, I don't know, she must have just wanted to help people because really at the time she didn't really get that much money. Um, I don't think she got really what she was worth for the effort that she had to go through. But we ended up doing a cycle, the first cycle we did with her eggs, 
Um, we had a, a number of embryos did not work. And then we had frozen embryos, and we tried again, and that's when I had my first child. And then a couple years later, we still had frozen embryos. We did another cycle, and I had my second child. And um, we even had a couple left after that, and we tried again, and that one failed. So I have two children from the same cycle from frozen um, embryos. And in, in your uh, the and how open have you been with your method of conception uh, as far as with your children as well as your, uh, your family and others outside of your family? We only a few close family members know, and my all my Resolve friends know. Um, with my children, as soon as they were old enough to understand how you know babies are made, we told them about this special person that helped us become parents and we talk we talk about it when it comes up now we kind of joke around if they say something about themselves I'll say you can't can't blame that one on me um, mm -hmm. and every once in a while I have to remind them it's like you realize that you're not genetically related to me because they'll say something oh I must have gotten that from mom's side of the family um, the reason why we weren't really open with it is because once you tell somebody you can't take it back and I really wanted it to be my kid's story. It's their story, and it's their story to tell. And um, I think, I don't know, they might have told a couple of their friends. I know that one time I was working backstage at a performance one of my kids was in, and the mom came up and said, oh, I heard that you did IVF and you used a frozen embryo. You know, like they'd had this whole discussion with this other yeah. parent. Um, but I wanted, I wanted them to, to be able to choose when and who to tell the story to. Okay, yeah, that. I, that uh, I think that I understand where you're coming from and why you would uh, choose that, and you've been, it sounds like, quite open with your ch with your children. So, yeah. Yes. That uh, yes. All right. Uh, let's see. Next up, uh, Claire Donahue. All right, Claire. Um, I uh, I know that uh, yours is a slightly different story in the sense that. Uh, at least at the beginning, you had no trouble getting pregnant, but staying pregnant was your issue. So tell us a little bit about your uh, infertility bona fides. Yeah, um, right. I got pregnant the first time out of the gate. Um, I got married when I was 30, had to wait a few months for a rubella shot before I could try. Um, got pregnant, had a miscarriage. Thought, okay, well, this is easy. Um, that's just bad luck. Um, sure. Went back to Not uncommon, right? try it again. <laughs> yeah, and... Um, same story, got pregnant and uh, then had a miscarriage. So after that, things got a lot more difficult and with more time and um, space between pregnancies and a lot of frustration. Um, at the end of the day, I ended up having five miscarriages. It took almost six years before my daughter was delivered. Um, I was never diagnosed with any specific um, condition that, caught, that we could identify. I went through you know, all the various tests. Um, and uh, so it was really, it was very surprising that, you know, I'd never heard of recurrent miscarriage. Um, I didn't know that it could go on and on. And so I was in that little bit of a, of an odd place of having conceived, but not being able to carry. And I will just also mention all of these miscarriages were early. Um, so they, you know, I was, always within the first trimester so I would have to have IUIs and um, DNCs at, when it was clear that there was no viable embryo um, so that uh, like I said it took, it took a lot of years I had a great physician um, who really kind of stuck with me and again resolve was a part of our lifelines to each other and to kind of keep us all sane on the path I um and when you I speak did a lot of the you, you had a when you when everyone is speaking of resolve resolve is an organization but in specific you were a part of an in person support group yes in person yeah. and also as a volunteer phone conversations with people so uh -huh. you know we had quite a, a network of of phone I mean the internet was still fairly new so we weren't all in chat rooms and that kind of thing our chat room was the phone okay. Excellent. Okay. And then uh, after you had your uh, biological child. Daughter, I'll just say uh, one conventional thing I did was HCG in the luteal phase, which was a little magic bullet. And that was what helped yeah. you conceive your uh, biological child. And then after you we had her, her uh, yeah, after yeah. you had <laughs> her, uh, did you have a look? Uh, I know you have two children. How did your second child come yes. to join your family? 
Yeah, so then I had a ruptured appendix about six months after my daughter was born, so that introduced yet another complication. Um, so I did try one IVF that failed, and then, again, through my resolve work on the telephone, I met somebody who was going to Romania to adopt a child, and she invited me to um, a party where we could come and meet children that were being adopted to this one agency. I did, and nine months later, we went to Romania and brought home my son, who is now 22. <laughs> so, excellent. Okay. Well, that's uh, – all right, so you have – had one successful round, uh, many miscarriages, one successful round of yeah. IVF, and then an international adoption. Okay. All right. Let's see. Next up, I think I would like to have Sue Johnston Blair. Um, I wanted to read something, Sue, from uh, um, uh, the book, your essay in the book. And I think, as I mentioned, the book is a collection of essays. So, you read the story of each person, and it's these five women as well as as, as a number of others. Uh, Sue, this is what you wrote. Months turned into years. I felt sadness and disappointment each month when my period arrived. It was all-consuming. I allowed myself to feel hope, yet the outcome was always the same. I never even had the luxury of being a little late or of purchasing a pregnancy test. I had prayed and prayed and prayed until I didn't have any prayers left. I had knocked on heaven's door and asked and knocked again and asked again for the blessing of a baby. I had never expected my faith to be so challenged. I became a shell of my former self. Life lost its color, its brilliance, and its beauty. Being so focused on getting pregnant caused me to lose sight of what was really important. Um, I think that, that many people who have experienced uh, infertility have felt that. So tell us, Sue, what brought you to this time, this, this period of despair and, and uh, how you eventually uh, resolved your infertility. Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, we went through nine IVFs, and that just takes a toll on a, on a oh couple. Um, it was just <laughs> oh, devastating. Oh, you. Yeah. Every, I mean, yeah. Every time yeah. I got the negative test, I just I just couldn't believe it, because I feel like in life I'm a winner, but I certainly wasn't a winner in this. And um, but so just let that sink into our audience. She went through. I'm going to repeat this, guys. She went through nine rounds of IVF. Let it sink in, guys. Nine. I. You know that's. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. All right. I'm sorry I interrupted, but go ahead. I just wanted to bring attention to oh, that. Oh, it, it was right. brutal. Yeah, it was brutal. Yeah. And then we finally crossed over to surrogacy. And at that point, having done the previous nine treatments, we were we were broke. You know, we had spent so much money. So we're like, how are we going to do this? And um, so we could not afford to go through an agency. So we found a surrogate on our own. And she was introduced to me by a coworker, and um, I interviewed two other women who were potential surrogates. And then we got a lawyer for our paperwork, and our surrogate got a lawyer to protect herself. And then, of course, she didn't get pregnant the first time we did it because it was just kind of the luck that we had. So then we went back and did it. Finally, did it again, and she did conceive that time. So um, that was just such exciting news. And I knew that I just knew in my heart that once we got pregnant, it was going to be a keeper. And our levels were low in the beginning, but sure enough, the pregnancy progressed as it should have. And we had a beautiful daughter and we're still dear friends to this day with our surrogate. We just had lunch with her yesterday and, um, our beautiful child is 20 years old and a, a co-ed at college, and we just, I feel like she's more of a sister than a friend. She just did so much for us and was such a true blessing in our life. I think one of oh, the hardest things yeah. for me about go, going over to surrogacy is you just, you have to give up control, and that was <laughs> really hard for me, <laughs> super, super yeah. hard, but you just have to accept the gift that she's willing to give to you. Oh, yeah, and the giving up control, I so understand that. Um, that's, um, um, that, I so understand the difficulty of it. I didn't mean I, I understood it specifically, but the, the difficulty of it, I can only imagine. 
Uh, all right. Um, last but certainly not least is Christina Ryan. Uh, let me tell everybody that Christina is being a real trooper. She is traveling and coming just back. She's been out of the country. She is in an airport right now <laughs> doing this interview. So we really appreciate Christina is standing outside at an airport. Fortunately, it's uh, in Florida, so she's not freezing. But uh, nonetheless, we certainly appreciate, your Christina, your, uh, your willingness to do this. All right, tell us about your infertility journey and how you resolved it. Well, for me, I um, I got married later on. I, I was 36 before I um, found the right guy. We got married. We decided, you know, this is wonderful. We both wanted to have a family. We had our careers set, and we were just ready to go. And um, But we, after a couple of years, I still didn't get pregnant, and um I started treatments and then basically went through just everything that I could tolerate and we could afford over the next five years. And, you know, just like all the other women, it was certainly one of the worst times of my life. And part of it, I mean, not only was it stressful because of everything going on, but just just the whole feeling of not being under control and um, and just the expense and just having that expectation that, you know, quite frankly, I felt like I was entitled to be a mother. I had done all the right things, even though I was older, I was um, very healthy. And so I was shocked when things didn't go as planned. So over that time, um, I tried all the procedures that were available um, to us at that time, and, it, and it's interesting how things evolve. Um, now, lo- like you mentioned, um, and I don't think anybody's mentioned yet, but I really felt like we were guinea pigs in a lot of ways because so many of these things were new, and it just seemed that um, adding insult to injury, the, the cost was just adding up and just becoming ast- astronomical i i started to feel like like sue that my goodness even if we did conceive at this time <laughs> we could be in so much debt that it it would make things very challenging so um over time i finally evolved to starting to explore other things i did talk to uh doctors who finally just um told me that it that um you know basically i was older and that my chances were really slim so finally i started realizing you know i really need to move on so that's when my husband and i started looking into other options and i have a younger sister who actually offered to donate her eggs and i was I was so touched by her offer, and my husband and I really considered it, but at that time, it was really something very new. Um, I, My sister was the same age I was when I stir, first started and wasn't successful, and I, start, I was concerned that, gee, we could put a lot of um, more money into this, and she may not be successful either, and it just seemed too awkward. So I decided that that wouldn't work, or we didn't. And so then we went the next step, and we found um, a couple who had completed their family and had extra embryos. So we looked into that, but as time went on, it just didn't feel right to us. It just We just sort of felt like, you know, those, even if I went through a pregnancy, it just didn't seem right. So our final step was to check into adoption. And even though so many couples have been so thrilled and happy with the results, I also saw some couples that did have regrets later on. And by this time, with the five years going by, a lot of things happened and my career was developing more. And I started to feel like it would be more valuable for me to use the resources that I was spending to try to build a family to go to graduate school, to develop my career more, to be traveling more. And over time, it finally came to a point where 
we just realized that it, it definitely was time to move on. There was really no point in pursuing that any longer. And my biggest regret was that I would, uh, or my biggest concern is that I would re- regret that later on. And so that always haunted me that that I would feel like, oh, gee, um, I could have, if I only pushed a little bit harder, I would have been successful. But after that long process, I felt like I had explored everything that was in my power, and I definitely was ready to move on. And interestingly enough, my my other sister got married later, also had problems conceiving, and she did take advantage of the um, the um, offer to donate eggs from my younger sister, and she did become pregnant with twins. And so at that stage, I was concerned that, oh, my gosh, am I going to really regret it? You know, that could yeah. have been me. And um, But the great thing was I was able to be a very special aunt. I love my nieces and nephews and um but when i was able to see all the issues that my sister dealt with in raising these children there were there was never a time where i felt like oh i'd really like to (laughs) trade places with her you know you said something in your essay that i thought was interesting that uh and this was that you, you realized at one point, I think it may be when you were considering adoption or maybe when you were had decided against the uh, the donated embryos, but it, when you and your husband were talking, you realized that each of you, both of you, had moved on past that, that where, where having children was the number one thing, and you hadn't even realized it, that, that life had gone on and you had changed, and your your things like you say your career was exploding and you were back in graduate school and there were exciting opportunities and all of a sudden but you hadn't even realized it because you were so much on the path of of taking that you know next step and trying to to, you know to to have a family which i thought was i think that's probably happens more often uh than we realize uh that you know we're not static during the time that we're trying to get pregnant you know things change things happen whatever i thought that was a an interesting thing, uh, and that was what helped you uh, finally moved on. Um, let me pause for a moment and remind everybody that you're listening to Creating a Family, and today we are talking with five women, all infertile, who chose different paths to resolving their infertility, uh, and it uh, is based on a book called Detours, Unexpected Journeys of Hope Conceived from Infertility. And let me remind everyone, uh, Creating a Family is a nonprofit, and I know that you're getting a lot of requests right now for donations because it's the end of year, Um, but we truly need your donation. Creating a Family is a small nonprofit. We do a lot with our resources, and we are making a difference in the lives of of the infertile as well as those uh, pre- and post-adoptive families. Here's an email I received uh, a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago. Uh, it's from Joanna, and she says, Your podcasts have been my saving grace, a source of fantastic and helpful information, and a daily therapy session. So thank you, thank you, thank you for dedicating your time and energy to women struggling with infertility who so appreciate your research. Um, Joanna's words, uh, let that be a, a, a motivator for you. Uh, with your donations, we can do even more than we are doing now. All right, now I am going to open it up. I want to talk with all of you, which is a bit of a challenge, I'm going to say, when we've got uh, five or actually six, counting me, on our switchboard. But we're going to give it a shot. Uh, All of these women know each other in real life, so this should be fun. Uh, And I also uh, want to – well, let's start with – Christina, you said something in your essay about um, one of your concerns – was the impact of I can hear them I can hear the uh, airport in the background there. Yes. <laughs> That's all right. Christina, one of your concerns was the impact of the fertility meds. In specific you talked about the your concern was the long and the short term 
physical impact uh, on your body, um, but also wanted to to to, 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 in, 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 to broaden that to to the to the physical, I mean to the emotional as well. But let's start, Christine. I want to start with you. So, how much of a factor was that concern? I, again, I think yours was probably more, if I read it correctly, more concerned about the physical impact. How big of an issue was that for you? Well, it definitely was an issue, and especially over time when I was continuing to have to use all these drugs that had such negative effects. And again, I felt like we were experimental animals because nobody had really tested these drugs long term. And um, and so that was a big concern to me. Also, just uh, whenever you, well, just basically whenever you're introducing hormones, there's no way of knowing exactly how how much they can impact you, not only at the time, but later on, and even for your ch- children um, later on. So that that did concern me, and there were a lot of things that doctors never told us that um, it was only through my resolved sisters and friends who had been through it that I would know what to expect from these drugs and procedures. Right, and and some of the things people have found that happens is is an intense emotional uh, response um, where our moods go all over the place. Um, I'm going to throw it open to the rest of you to talk a little about from the uh, from the emotional uh, side of things. If you would please uh, remember to say your name and then uh, talk. Um, how much did the drugs affect you emotionally? And whoever wants to answer that one can jump in. Um, well, this is Sue Johnston, and um, I, I think that the drugs, I think that the the worst part about the drugs is that they simulate pregnancy. And so your mind gets all, you know, wrapped up in, could this be a sign that I'm pregnant because you feel bloated, you feel emotional, your breasts get tender, your, um, you know, your period doesn't come when you're on some of these medications because you have to wait until you're here off the medications and then your period comes and you, it it just makes you, it plays tricks on your mind and your heart and everything and your body. And, um, it, they're so evil. (laughs) It's no wonder we feel, uh, you know, it's no wonder you feel so anxious and emotional when you're going through something like this. Somebody in, uh, we have a large, uh, the Creating a Family has a large online support group, and somebody called uh-huh. Floman, Satan in a Bottle. Yes. <laughs> yes. It made me exactly. laugh so hard. Uh, yeah. And that's Clomid, mm-hmm. and which for some people is, you know, right. people can think of the oral meds as being the, the light stuff, uh, mm-hmm. which, of course, is not actually true. Uh, Claire, did you find, uh, well, you may not have had as many uh, of the drugs with the miscarriages. Well, although at the end you were on, uh, uh, you did have to go through treatment. Uh, Claire, did you find that the emotional impact of the drugs made things hard for you uh, and, and uh, hard for your marriage or hard for, just hard for you, let's put it that way? Yes, of course. I mean, I didn't start on the drugs until I think after the third or fourth miscarriage. Um, and then it was the typical, um, you know, Clomid and then um, Perganol and so forth. So those were, so I did experience all of that. I also was trying things on the back end, progesterone and, as I said, um, uh, HCG, which was unconventional. Um, but I did all kinds of other crazy things. So pretty much I felt like I was crazy for probably a good three years. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, per- pregnancy test came out then um, that you could buy over the counter. They were still pretty expensive, but I was buying those every month practically. So a lot of my emotional stuff was that waiting, watching, wondering, um, not necessarily going through the full treatment. Um, I was also working full time. And at the t- so there were a lot of tests that I would do like um, histiosopangogram, for example, and I would, I would do that and then jump on an airplane and go to the East coast. So you're in very much a coping mode mm-hmm. and you really don't know in some ways how much it's affecting you until it's over <laughs> so i i really yeah. think that um you're kind of in a little bit of a ptsd life for a while you know and and it's not just the drugs it's as, as you were saying it's the and, and sue as well it's the 
the the rising of the hope to have it crashed at the thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sue Johnson Blair, you wrote a beautiful thing about, well, not beautiful, it was actually poignant. Um, uh, it said something about nothing rocked your world like the pain of that first failed IVF pregnancy test you had gone through. And, and you said, you know, you had lost both of your parents. You had had bad things happen to you, but that one, that laid you low. Uh, um, I'm not putting words in your mouth saying lower than other things, but uh, did it ever get any, you went through nine more or eight more rounds. Um, did it ever get any easier? No, it never did. It never got easy. I didn't even recognize myself emotionally. I never knew who I was going to wake up to. And that's really scary when it's yourself. <laughs> it's <laughs> bad, you know, and then you're trying yeah. to keep your marriage strong and he's going through his thing and you're going through your thing, yet you're still trying to connect. And, yeah, it was just a really, really tough time that I do not wish on anyone. It was hard. Yeah, I've heard other people. I wouldn't wish this on my uh, worst enemy. Yeah. You know, I'm glad you raised the impact of infertility on your marriage. I know that uh, Sue Johnston, I, I believe it was your essay, at one point you turned to your husband. His, his tests were all going to be positive. Actually, I believe yours were too, but you figured it had to be you. So that was the infertile one. Um, and you suggested that it, that that he, since he, he deserved to have children, he should divorce you. And 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 I think that right. I think that feeling is not at all uncommon. So mm-hmm. uh, tell us about the impact of infertility on your marriage. Right. Well, it was it was difficult because um, well, my situation was a little more complicated in that. My husband was a captain in the United States Navy, and he was going to sea all the time. So we really had to be schedule-driven when he was home. And when he was gone, it was um, – we were working – I was working alone with frozen embryos, and he was trying to, you know, dovetail into his career and how this was going to fit in with his life and, and everything. So it, I just felt like – we were leading two separate lives at times, and I felt like, you know, if you want to divorce me and get, you know, have a life with somebody else, that maybe you would, um, you know, you deserve to have children. And and he is a wonderful person, and he loved me so much. And he said, you know, I'm with you through thick and thin with this, and I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to divorce you. If we have children, we will, you know, have them together. Um, if not, then I'm happy the way I, the way it is with you. So I feel like we, although it was, we were steadfast in our love for each other. There, it was definitely stressful. I remember going to um, counseling together with him, and just trying to deal with him and his goals of wanting to be a Navy ship driver and and be a father too, and challenging so my battery's um beeping i may have to get on another line okay so i'm gonna let somebody else chime in maybe uh yeah christina i was going to ask you i know that you're going to have to leave us at some point so uh, i wanted to uh talk with you about that when you decided to move to child free one of the things that i've heard other people who are are considering that option talk about it's the feeling of like they, that if they choose the child-free path, uh, and some say, "Look, I didn't choose it; it was thrust upon me." So, uh, so take that the word "choose." Know that I'm putting air quotes around it, but that that somehow they're giving up; they're not trying hard enough; that they're they're letting down the sisterhood. And if they would just keep trying, that next round of IVF is going to work. You're you're giving up your dream. Did you feel that way when you made the uh, the choice to move to uh, child free, or to accept child free? Maybe a better way to say it. Well, I certainly felt that way along the path, and um, and especially because there weren't any really good role models uh, for yeah. me. So I did sort of feel, especially since all my resolve friends ended up um, resolving things by having children, I was the exception. Fortunately, we're such good friends that they've included me in so many things afterwards that I, you know, I, I watched their children grow up. I watched, I've been mentors to their children. 
and and my husband too. I mean that was I mean it was certainly the two of us um, in this together, and you know that was one of the reasons why we got married. So I was also very you know I was like Sue where I I felt that um, that somehow I might have let him down, but fortunately in both of our careers. Um, We have found many wonderful opportunities to, again, be mentors, teachers, and and then certainly with our own nieces and nephews. And in our careers, we've been able to fulfill what we really wanted and what was really important to us in our lives. So we, neither one of us have felt like we gave up, but it took going through the whole process and going through each step and evaluating each step along the way to come to that point. Yeah, I can understand that. You, I think it was in your essay, you described fertility treatment as a roller coaster. My analogy is, is infertility treatment is like an escalator because it seems like each successive treatment is coming at you and, and you're taking that step without ever really thinking about it or, or really thinking through your options because it's just the next step. Uh, and, um, and, and so I, I think that's one of the, if I could make a change in the, the way infertility treatment is practiced, it would be to encourage uh, clinics and, and, and or patients to realize that the next step of resolution is a choice. The next IVF cycle is a choice that, uh, and it may well be a choice you want, but it's, it often helps to take a moment to think and say, is this the, is this the next step? It's not necessarily, uh, not necessarily an automatic given. Uh, let me pause for just a moment to remind you that uh, this show is brought to you by our partners. We are fortunate to have many partners who believe in our mission of providing unbiased education and support to the infertile as well as those who are adoptive parents or those considering adoption. Uh, some of our wonderful partners include Adoptions from the Heart. They have helped build over 6,000 families since 1985 through domestic infant adoption. They work with people all across the U.S., but they're licensed in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Delaware, Virginia, and Connecticut. We also have Somatics. They are a next-generation women's health company transforming how women approach their lifelong fertility journey through genomics and big data. The company's products include Fertilome, the world's first comprehensive genetic test that reveals uh, what a woman's DNA says about her reproductive health, uh, as well as Polaris, which is a real-time predictive analytic plat- an- excuse me, analytic plat- analytic platform, easy for me to say, right? Uh, that uh, uh, allows uh, uh, clinics uh, to help assess the next step for for women in their treatment. All right, I I wanted to come back uh, to talking about uh, biology. And, and Lee, I wondered, you were the one who uh, ended up using donor egg uh, for your two children, same donor. And um, how important, when you were first realized you were infertile, how important was biology, and, and was there a hurdle for you to uh, to not have a biological connection to your children? Well, I think it was going through having to go through that whole process. If you would have asked me at the beginning, I probably would have said yes. I really would like to have a, a genetically related child to me. But as we kept going through the whole process and having failures all along the way. I just had to reevaluate what was it I really wanted, and what I really wanted was to be a mom. Um, and it got to the point where it really didn't matter to me um, if that, you know, if there was that genetic connection or not. It, it, I realized that's not what I wanted. What I wanted was to be a parent. So, um, but I think I had to go through that whole process in order to get to that point. And, and Susie Johnson Blair. Um, you, uh, I, I believe, if I'm remembering your essay, decided against adoption. Uh, I, I don't know that egg donation was something that was really uh, something considered. How important, you ended up having your child through surrogacy, but it was an embryo uh, using your egg and your husband's sperm. How important was it to, to you and your partner, your husband, for there to be a genetic connection? 
It was not important to me at all, but it was 1,000% important to my husband to have his own biological child. So he's the one that kept driving the train that, you know, no, we have to have our biological child. Has, you know, he just did not feel like he could love an adoptive child, which I don't know if that's true, but I do believe in his heart he felt that way. So that's why we just kept going and going and going, just like the Energizer Bunny. And <laughs> Did it, you resent that at times since it wasn't? Of if course it, if I it did. Wasn't I mean, yeah, I just felt yeah. like on another hand there was an easier way to go about this because the same thing, I just wanted to be a mom. And I knew that I could be a good mom to whoever God wanted us to have. I knew that. But he did not know that. And so, but we we finally lucked out and we got one and we got a good one. And I'll be forever <laughs> grateful about that. But, yeah, he was the one that just did not feel like. And I think you need to, everybody's coming to the table with different expectations. And you need to respect that in your partner and listen to what they're saying. Because. If it's important to them, it's going to be important to you. So you need to remember each other's needs. Oh, you are a partnership, yeah, and that's yeah. Yes, uh, Claire, you ended up doing it both ways in the sense of having a biological yeah. child and having an adopted child. Um, mm-hmm. Any thoughts on for people who are listening who are trying to make a decision on how important biology is? Well, you know, I found that my kids are completely unique and different, each in their own way. The biology is kind of the last thing we think about. Um, My son and I are very close. Um, I always say, like, the bad part of the biology, lucky you, you don't have our genes (laughs) (laughs) for some of our vices and so forth. Um, I always say, feel like there is kind of a a deep cultural DNA that comes along with um, with adoption, my son, as I said, is Romanian, and there are some behaviors and, and ways that he is in the world that I think are just very related to his deep origins, not necessarily his family of origin. Yeah. Um, my daughter, the same way. Um, you know, she came with her own set of, of quirks and characteristics. I always said, you know, I tried not to claim her in the same way. I don't know. It was just, for me, both of my kids were their kids. Where, where they they were there the individuals that they are versus like an expression of me or an expression of Mike. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. and so I really tried to keep that in mind. Um, uh, and so my mother was a birth mother, and um, so adoption had been in my family in a kind of peripheral way, and so I had a lot of um, empathy for the birth mother. And um, I have since taken my son to meet his birth family in Romania. Because, again, I felt that it was important that he be able to put the face and the place together and then make choices about where he wanted to go beyond that. Um, So, um, you know, I always say don't be afraid of other people's genes. You married somebody who doesn't have your genes. (laughs) So, um, I have a a friend who is uh, a, a mom through egg donation. And she says, I think the greatest gift I ever gave my child was not passing on my genes. I mean, she's got a number of health <laughs> impacts. She's got a number of health issues and nothing really that serious. But I've always laughed. And she said, you know, people act like, you know, their genes are so important. She goes, I've known some of these people. And I think, you know, not really. I mean, you know. <laughs> no offense, but, <laughs> so, uh, so that's it's true. another way. Yeah, that's another way yeah. to, to to view it. I should add that I am also yep. a mom by both birth and adoption, so it might influence where I'm. Uh, what I'm thinking, my husband always says we went fishing in the uh, deep end of the gene pool we, uh, with with our adoption. So there you go. Um, yeah. All right. I wanted to talk about. I think that uh, this goes back to my uh, escalator analogy. Uh, it, it's how do you know when it is time to try something different? Uh, and, and there isn't one answer for every person, that is for certain. Um, but let's talk about how, uh, Lee, let's start with you. How did you know it was time to move, to, to, to no longer try using your own eggs? Each step along the way, moving to the next step was difficult for me. I think that's one regret that I have is that I stuck too long trying one thing before moving on to something else. Mm-hmm. Um I just kept hoping that that was going to work. 
by the time we got to the point where we had to, we were making that decision about donor egg, it was either that or quit entirely because I was done at that point. And my husband and I could not agree on adoption, so it was either give up entirely on becoming parents or move to donor egg. I thought that's where we were. And I was thrilled to be able to, to, uh, to move on at that point because I wanted, I wanted to have hope that we were doing something that was going to work and nothing we had done up to that point was successful. So um, it, it, was, it felt good at that point to move, to move into that, that process. Susie, how about you? Um, how did you know with each of your um, – you went through nine rounds of IVF. So uh, with each round, how did you make the decision? Or did you even give it thought? Or was it just truly the next thing you were going to do because it was offered? Um, or did you consciously think each time, is this a choice that I want to make? Oh, it was Susie, difficult. I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, it was. it was difficult, and – we lost track of what plan we were on. You know, you think you start at plan A. Were we at plan B? We didn't even know where we were. Yeah. It was just, you know, and emotionally, you know, you, you just don't know how much more you can take because it definitely takes its toll. And um, so we just kept keeping on and, and you know, when we – moved on to surrogacy, it was it was hard to go from thinking I was going to be able to get pregnant to moving on to surrogacy. It was a very hard decision. But once we made that decision, we went with it, and it all kind of fell into place. So it was worth it. Um, I don't think there really is a roadmap that you can follow. It's just a journey that you're on, and you do the best that you can with the resources that you have, with the strength and wisdom and the emotions that you have left to battle this, to build your family. And I don't think it really matters how you do it as long as you do it and, and you get to the end result that you are happy with, that you as a couple are happy with. Yeah, Christina, the loss of control, you were a, an accomplished person, uh, you had uh, you were later getting married. You had had a lot of successes in your life, and the the loss of control over how you thought your life was going to be and how it and, and your belief that you could make it happen. How did that impact you? I think that's a uh, that's one of the losses in infertility that people seldom talk about. Well, for me, I think that's one of the reasons why I was able to move on. Because throughout the whole process, feeling like I was out of control, it was, it was just extremely difficult. So when I started to take a different path and started focusing on other things besides treatments and, and um, building a family, I found that that was much more rewarding to me. And, and I did finally feel like I was under control and that I finally, um, I could actually control to not be a parent. And, and that was one thing that, that was so amazing because you think of so many women, including me, who, you know, you, for many years you, you worry about becoming pregnant. And that is <laughs> something that every woman has some control over, either, you know, whether it's birth control or abortion or anything. But ultimately, a woman can have control over that in her life. But as far as um, actually becoming pregnant, you can't control that. That's mm -hmm. outside of your your whole realm. So for me, that's... Um, that's how I was able to move on. And, and then especially once I was at that point, looking back, I felt satisfied and felt that my life actually really was going in the right direction for me. Sue so Johnston, how did the lack of control play out in, in your choices and also in how, how infertility impacted you? I think that's such a good question that we're all addressing here today because I feel that, as as um, Christina just said, 
you, you cannot control if you are getting it, it, it you cannot control getting pregnant. That is out of the realm of your control. But what is but within they never your tell control us this in high school? You know, they they're don't. always telling us the, yeah, the opposite. Right, right. You know, so you think exactly. that you're going to have that control. Yeah. Exactly. So I, I felt like the doctors would want me to go a certain direction or told me. I can remember one doctor saying, "I think that you have less than four percent chance of ever conceiving, and you should just." think about adoption and for me that was not something I was willing to address at that time I mean did I think about it yes but I wasn't ready to try that so I switched doctors I didn't and luckily at that time there was a doctor who was setting up a satellite office in uh, Southern California and I thought I'm going to go to that doctor so I had that was within my control um, something else that was within my control was figuring out, you know, is there any other alternative? I spoke spoke with a doctor about, you know, uh, a medication that was, it was on the horizon then. It was a medication that was used for transplant patients that would keep them from, their body from thinking of a, you know, a transplant as a foreign object. And they you know, said, well, this is experimental. Would you want to try this? And I thought, you know, that is within my control as well. Um, so, yeah, I, I chose to use a medication that was experimental. Um, I re- remember a nurse that said, to, or a social worker that was leading one of the support groups and said, why don't you just take a break? And well, my husband was going to sea all the time, and the Navy forced these breaks on us. I mean, two-and-a-half-year break in the Philippines, uh, yeah, that was out of my control. A six-month deployment, eight months at, you know, prospective commanding officer school, that was out of my control. But I wasn't willing to take a break, even though the social worker thought emotionally I should have taken a break. I just had to say, no, I'm not going to listen to that. It doesn't feel right to me. I need to follow my gut instincts and listen to my heart. And those are things that are within our control uh, in this crazy mixed up world of infertility treatment. So yes, that's, that's kind of how I coped with it. All right. And this will be our last question. I'm going to go down and, and ask each of you and Christina, I will start with you because as I said, I know you're trying to catch a plane at some point. If you could give one piece of advice to your younger self at the beginning of your infertility journey, what would it be? I think it would be to just um, just do the best you can in every step of the way. And that's it. You know, things will resolve in one way or another. If, you, if you're not ready to give up, then just... Um, continue, but once you realize that it's time to move on, then move on. All right, good advice. Susan Johnson Blair, can you give us your one piece of advice that you would give your younger self? Yes, I would give myself the piece of advice to take care of myself. Do things that bring you pleasure, and nobody takes better care of you than you, and you have to find things that bring you pleasure during this journey and just whatever it may be find it do it don't feel guilty about it just enjoy it because the grief is so deep that you really need to offset that with something else so just be easy on yourself and take care of yourself claire donahue yeah um well, I, I second uh, what's been said. Um, I think the other thing, which is really not about to my specifically my younger self, but to younger women today, is to not think you have forever. Um, I think there's kind of a a belief big deal, and I encourage people to think about building their family when they're younger because nothing is ever perfect. And that was the other thing. You know, there's never a perfect time. And so I, I think that's that's the advice I would give my daughter and um, and other young people is if you want to have a family, go for it. <laughs> don't, and wait don't wait for, time, till time is set up. 
Uh, yeah, Lee exactly. Allison, final thoughts that for your younger self. Yeah, I when Sue was talking, it really I think I felt like I lost my whole 30s to just this whole emotional roller coaster of infertility and I think I would have said, you know, enjoy the the rest of your life too and not not lose I felt like I lost so much of myself to infertility. I wish I would have embraced more of my family relationships, taken a vacation with my husband and done some other things um, during that time. And Sue Johnston, uh, giving you the last word here. (laughs) Okay. Well, I, I feel like I would just want to offer hope for everybody that's listening. I feel that when we're in the thick of our battle, it, and rightfully so, we just can't see the forest for the trees. We cannot see that there is any way out of this, and it just feels so overwhelming. Um, but I think that it's so important to just remind yourself that somehow, some way, you're going to get resolution. Is this the resolution that we would have wanted at the very beginning, at the onset? No, we all would have loved to have gotten pregnant and and. and in the first try and never had to deal with infertility at all. But I just want to let everybody know that there will be brighter days ahead for you. And, um, you know, again, to be kind to yourself too, but know that there will be a resolution somehow, some way you're going to get through this. And, um, yeah, to just hold on to hope and, uh, and don't give up on your dreams and it will work out for you somehow, some way. Maybe not be your first choice or second choice, but you will get there. Oh, that is uh, I, that was the a perfect code to end on. That was I, I thank you. Uh, let me remind everybody that the name of the book you can read these essays, uh, both from our five guests as well as others who also had other w- uh, methods of resolution. Uh, the title of the book is Detours. Unexpected Journeys of Hope Conceived from Infertility. I'm going to let you know in just a minute how to get a hold of this book. But I wanted to remind you uh, of one more of our partners whose generosity allows us to bring you this show, and that is Manhattan Cryobank. They are dedicated to helping clients have healthy babies by analyzing a client's DNA in combination with the DNA of prospective sperm donors. This provides this allows them to provide each client with a personalized catalog of safer donor matches. And in addition to donor sperm services, uh, Manhattan Cryobank also offers a full range of andrology and fertility preservation services as well. I uh, want to remind you that uh, this information that we provide here is, uh, is, is general advice to understand how it applies to your specific situation. Of course, talk with your professional that you're working with. Now, how to get a hold of this book available on Amazon. Uh, what we've also uh, uh, mentioned on a number of times during this interview that uh, all of these women met through an in-person support group uh, put on by Resolve.org. You can go or put on by Resolve. You can go to their website to get information on if there is an in-person support group next near you, uh, and their website is Resolve.org. Uh, there are also a number of online support groups, including one run by Creating a Family. It's a Facebook group, so facebook.com slash groups slash Creating a Family, or just type in the words Creating a Family in the search box, and we will pop up. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, I wish everyone a happy holiday season, uh, and uh, I will see you next week. Your hands were made for greatness. Mighty hands for painting, paneling, and clicking the submit order button on homedepot.com to get that duvet. And these Egyptian cotton towels delivered right to your door. Do more with decor at the Home Depot. Save up to 30% on select bedding and bath. Now at homedepot.com. More saving, more kinds of doing. Ballot on select items online only. Free delivery on select items $45 or more. Enter promo code BEDBATH15 at purchase for an extra 15% off. Visit homedepot.com for more information. Your hands were made for greatness. Mighty hands for painting, paneling, and clicking the submit order button on homedepot.com to get that duvet. And these Egyptian cotton towels delivered right to your door. Do more with decor at the Home Depot. Save up to 30% on select bedding and bath. Now at homedepot.com. More saving, more kinds of doing. Ballot on select items online only. Free delivery on select items $45 or more. Enter promo code BEDBATH15 at purchase for an extra 15% off. Visit homedepot.com for more information.